Jeb. Let's go, guys. Welcome to another week of the Educated Home Buyer Live, where Josh and I answer your questions, help you become the educated home buyer. The big news this week is that mortgage rates are screwed. And if you're looking to buy a home, it's going to cost more money in the short term. No, in all reality, inflation is still high. Employment looks to be strong. The Fed has come out and more or less confirmed that they're data dependent. And at the moment, the data doesn't support them doing anything differently than what they're currently doing, which essentially has taken one of the rate cuts off the table and looks more like if you're going off uh, predictions that maybe two rate cuts this year, Josh, instead of three uh, or or six, as we thought uh, a couple months back. We're still very early in the game, Jeb. We are. I'm not, I'm not calling for it, but I'm not ruling it out either. Things change rather rapidly, and we have enough mixed signals that if you told me things are rosy in December and we've got no cuts, I'd say, okay, I see it. If you told me things reverted to what we thought they were 90 days ago and we get four cuts, wouldn't shock me. It would be surprising, but it wouldn't be shocking. Um, so, yeah, for now, the wind is blowing in this direction, so we go where the day takes us, right? That's it. Uh, but we're going to start like we always do by looking at some charts, looking at some data um, and help, you know, guiding you guys through the process. Now, while we're doing this, it's very helpful if you're watching and you have questions that you start putting the questions in now. That way, when we're done, we can start answering those questions. Now, if you're first time here, first time listening to this, uh, just type in your question. We answer it. If you are listening to this on Friday, which comes out on the podcast, you know, we do this every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So you can always show up and get your question answered or you can email us directly and we're happy to do it. So we always start by looking at inventory. Inventory tells where the market is and where it's going. And as we can see here, we actually saw a pretty big jump uh, week over week, as we said, was likely to happen. And because last week uh, included Easter, the data was partly due to the data last week included Easter, so it was less than um, what would normally be expected to happen during that week. So this week we saw inventory jump from 513 up to 527. So 14 or 15,000 homes came on the market during that period of time, which is which is a pretty big jump, uh, but only because it includes two weeks. So we're still trending, you know, um, lower than 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 we have in previous years, as you can see. Um, based on the data here, but looking at Orange County currently sitting at 2256, which is the, the highest level of, of homes that we've seen on the market this year so far. Huntington Beach is at 134. We're actually pretty close to the lowest levels we've seen in inventory so far. So when we talk about real estate being local, Orange County is the county that Huntington Beach is, is located in. Inventory is increasing, but here in our market, inventory is actually decreasing. So Make sure you're paying attention. You know, if you're in a market like Florida, Louisiana, Texas, some of these markets are seeing not only year over year increases in inventory, but increases going all the way back to 2019. You're back to, you know, pre pandemic levels in some of these markets, which is something you have to watch. So, Josh, as we discussed earlier, we went from 512, 930 to 526, 462. Uh, you know, the peak in 2023 was 569. So we still haven't peaked above those levels of 2023, but we're, we're, uh, we're, we're headed in that direction, but understand that number 569 didn't even happen until November of last year, which is kind of rare, uh, because typically that's when a, a time in the market, when inventory would be going down last year was a little bit different because, you know, we saw, not only inventory rising, but we saw mortgage rates come down a little bit, and that allowed uh, more sellers to come to the market during that period of time. Uh, let's pull up, Josh, while I'm doing this here. You can look at the new listings well, data, but I actually well, forgot to pull yeah, up. Yeah, while you have that weekly commentary. new listings, for those, of, for those of you who are here who were here last week, remember I questioned how big of an impact uh, Easter Sunday really has on this, but you're going to see uh, this chart and not the next one, but the one after this show a very big dip for Easter week and then a big spike here in new listings. So apparently many people did hold off on listing their homes uh, Easter week. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you're streaming any other thing on your side, Josh, but uh, if you can hit it because you're, uh, you're, you just went out on the, on the live feed for a minute there. 
So um, I don't know if it's while uh, you're going through your charts, let me restart it because I just shut a bunch of stuff off. And yeah, you've yep. been cutting out on me also. So I'm going to restart the whole thing. So just go through your charts. I'll be back in two seconds. Got it. Good stuff. All right, guys. So we started out by looking at new inventory sitting at 526,000. That was up 2.6% from last week, but uh, and also up 30% from more than one year ago. But as you could see from those charts earlier, still below where we need to be. Now, new listings, 67,000 new listings unsold this week, plus another 20,000 new listings that are already in contract. That's 32% 32, 32 more sellers this week than last year during that same uh, that same period of time. Uh, there were more sellers this week than in any week of 2023. That's that's interesting to note. Now, the question is, does that trend continue or is it because of that Easter holiday that fell in there? So people decided to wait a week and, and list that following week, which added to that inventory. So hard to say at this point, but we'll be able to see as we uh, continue to monitor week over week. I thought this was an interesting chart to throw in here because people are always asking what's happening with inventory, what's happening in this area. So this is actually from Calculated Risk, which is a sub stack uh, that both Josh and I subscribe to. But you can see here, what's important to note, in my opinion, is looking at the year over year numbers and then more importantly, looking at the, the, the numbers compared to 2019. Now you'll see some markets are missing just because they didn't have the data by the time that he put this out. Uh, but this was based on the end of March. So as you can tell, we're you know halfway through April now. So it's a little delayed, but it's really good information. So, you know, look at Albuquerque, for example. Inventory's up nearly 13% year over year, but it's still down almost 44% from that time in 2019. And you can kind of see the different numbers there, but I think it's important to pay attention to uh where was it? Was it Jacksonville was one of the markets? So Jacksonville inventory's up. 51.4% year over year and actually up almost 12% from that same time back in 2019. That's something to follow, right? So if you're in the Jacksonville market, it's it's probably softening a little bit. You're not seeing the the price increases. You're not seeing the competitive nature that we're experiencing here in Southern California. But anyhow, you might be able to find your market on there. You might not because Again, some of the markets he just doesn't have the data for, but always interesting to pay attention to. Now, if you're watching this uh, or listening to this rather, and um, you know you don't see the charts, we actually put the charts in our school community. So if you become a member of the community, you can actually check out those charts in the community and have access to them and all that good stuff. Uh, here, we're looking at home prices. So median home price, uh, newly in contract is sitting at 389 900 that dipped this week and is actually 1% below where we were in 2022 at that same period of time. That's going to take us into weekly new contracts pending and 69,000 new pending sales this week. That's 10% more than a year ago and a 7% jump from last week. Now, Mike Simonson, who is, you know, who used to own Altos Research until they sold it to Housing Wire says that's encouraging that sales keep coming in ahead of last year. It's not a lot of growth and many parts of the country haven't grown enough yet. 371,000 single family homes in contract now. That's only 4% more than last year. Homes are spending 38 days in contract. So these will likely close in May. So most of those that are under contract will actually close in May. And then percentage of properties that are doing some sort of price reduction sitting at 32%. And we've talked about that normal range being 30 to 33%. So well within that normal range. Now, Josh, this is where we look at what's happening with our lovely, lovely CPI numbers and where, well, where things are falling. This, so that the headline there says CPI adjusted, but really I threw this in here because um, we did the episode last week on why homeowners insurance is going through the roof. We talked about loss frequency and then loss severity. Loss severity is largely due to inflation. It costs more for materials and labor to rebuild a house after there is a disaster. This chart here shows the inflation adjusted billion dollar disaster events since 1980. And as you can see, basically every type of disaster event has been been increasing. Um, there are those that will tell you that is because of man-made uh, climate change um, 
maybe it's just the wrath of God. It could be any number of things, but there is no debating here, despite the fact what some of our friends on YouTube would say that we're, we're in the pocket of the insurance companies with all that insurance money that we don't have, Jeb. But this is this numbers don't lie. This is what they're paying out in terms of insurance claims. This one, Jeb, um, this came in uh, across in an email that you sent over today. Thought it was interesting and interesting for a couple of reasons. The top purchase lenders of 2023. Number one there on a list, on the list says wholesale. They are wholesale. They only work through brokers, but I don't know if you saw it, Jeb. Uh, they are in the middle of a class action lawsuit because many of the brokers that work with them only broker to them, like 95 to 100% of their loans go to United Wholesale. So there are good things to say about UWM. We use w, UWM, but um, be careful if you're working with a broker who says they're a broker, but then you find out they only send all of their loans to UWM because you're not getting that exposure to different guidelines, different rate options, all of that fun stuff. The other thing to point out, um, without going through names on the list here, but one, two, two of them this week, we opened purchases for listeners, viewers of the show, um, whether it's Jeb's videos, whether it's the podcast, whether it's the live here um, that started with two of those lenders in the top five. One of them found out they were going to be $7,000 more expensive. And the other one was a uh, half point on a $900,000 purchase. So pretty significant amounts of money. So we always want to say here on the Jeb, on the Jeb, on the show, Jeb, on the Jeb show, yes, on the Jeb right. show, on the Jeb show, we always want to say that the price is not the most important thing, but it is important that you get a competitive price. You want knowledge, you want expertise, you want someone you connect with and are comfortable with, and that gets you competitive terms. I can tell you five of those 10 lenders do not get you competitive terms. And two or three of them are either builder lenders or big national banks, which uh, are limited in their, their functionality. But long way of saying, if you're looking for a second opinion, we're always happy to look at it. And if you are happy with the loan officer you're working with and they're getting you good terms, we're very happy to just confirm that you're on the right track and give you that kind of peace of mind. And many times, maybe it's one out of three, one out of four, we can save you a big chunk of money. This one, Jeb, here is actually really important and I don't have it up. So in Europe, this is the funny thing. Um, my restart here screwed me up on this. Um, but what this is, is their measure, HICP, it's a fancy word for how in Europe they measure CPI. They don't use owner's equivalent rents the way we do here in the US. And because of that, you get a much more reasonable number. There's, there's a reason why we do OER, but there's also some limitations and some problems with it. We talk about it here every week, how it's generally overstating inflation. Well, the interesting thing in the EU, when they do their numbers, they run their numbers for our economy as well. This shows you that according to their measures, we are back basically to where inflation was pre-pandemic. And that's largely because they have a different measure of, of what housing costs are uh, and how they're being measured. This again, Jeb, we've talked about this one. I don't yeah. know how much I, I love or, or trust or don't trust Trueflation. It's at 2.05. Uh, as recent as what, three, four weeks ago, it was up at 2.6, 2.7. Definitely showing lower than what we're seeing in PCE and CPI. And over the long haul, it does have a 97% correlation to CPI. So it'll be interesting to see where this yeah, goes you in know, the long run. We, we couldn't figure it out, though. I mean, like some of the adjustments they did in there, you know, it was like, one week they would send it out and the range would be different than the next week, but yet it was the same chart. So, yeah, you know, when you're looking at this, guys, take it with a grain of salt to some degree, right? I mean, I think it shows inflation is coming down, which I think we can all agree to some, to, you know, to, to the large uh, extent that that's the case. But, you know, the numbers aren't reflecting it all the way across the board. But anyhow. Absolutely. So it's just another measure to keep an eye on. Um, it's a hard one to track. So you had mentioned, Jeb, what are we expecting? What is the market expecting? Um, this is the, the FedWatch, Fed Funds Futures uh, CME FedWatch tool. So the important thing to remember, this is real investors wagering real money in the markets, but it is truly a now cast. This changes day by day. As additional information comes in, these odds change. We At one point, we're showing you like a 90% chance of, uh, it was either March or May, uh, being a cut. And now it's 95% chance there's nothing there. So as of right now, September, 72% chance of a cut, uh, November, 79%, December, 89. And that's not a cut at every one of those. It is a cut by that point in time. 
So the markets are still believing that we are going to see those cuts, um, but there's obviously a lot of dissension and a lot of different feelings in there. Threw this one in here, Jeb, because I thought this was interesting. We look at home prices in states, but it may be more important when you're deciding where to live because it can dictate how long you get to live. So the green dots are different countries around the world. The pink ones are different states in the United States. So if you're in Hawaii, you're right on par with Germany, Britain, uh, and looking at an 81, 82 year lifespan. But if you're in Mississippi, they are almost 10 years less at 71 and a half years. So you, you may want to look in Mississippi. You they, know, they either work harder or it's too much sweet tea. I'm thinking too much sweet tea is, is what my thought is. You know, you, I don't know that you can have too much sweet. Well, I mean, listen, do most of my families live to the eighties, nineties and they drink in Sweet tea all day. Sweet tea. The like they can't get enough of it. So I, I don't right. I don't know that that's the correlation. I think it's work. Right. I think it's the hard labor that uh, that the Southerners put in. But anyhow. All right. Well, well, what you are will notice here is California, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Utah, all on the high end of the scale. And our southern friends and Midwestern friends are a little lower on the scale. So um, kielbasa and uh, sweet tea are dangerous. Jeb, this pretty little rainbow here going back to interest rates. This is the 10 year. Um, that red line at the top is up roughly around 5%. That's the highs that we've seen. If we don't hold right here at that orange line, we're a little bit below it today, 466. I, I didn't look and see exactly where we closed, Jeb, but a little bit below 470. If that doesn't hold, we're going to make a run. Spoiler to alert, Josh. It's going above that level back up to Jeb, five. Jeb is, Jeb is putting his cards on the table and saying it's going to five yeah um, i, I said see, when it was at like four three i was like that thing's going to five but we'll so see. the the green bars are the good news that if we start approaching those and dropping below those that's good news but the the blue ones shows that we are in a very defined up channel since the beginning of january or so what you will notice if you are thinking in terms of locking when we are at the top of this channel you will usually make a run to the bottom that does not mean that anything has changed we saw a very nice day in the bond market today. That does not tell Jeb that, hey, you're wrong. It's not going to 5%. It tells you that it doesn't, doesn't go up in a straight line. We talked about that a lot in December when like every day the bond market was better, 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 better. And people are like, oh, should I lock or should I wait? And they, well, don't expect that it's going to continually go in one direction. And that includes when the direction is bad or the direction that we don't want to go. And Jeb, this is something we've been talking about repeatedly. Yep. What, are, what are your thoughts? You know, it's not good. Uh, we're sitting at $34 trillion in debt. This came through my uh, something I was looking at last night, and I, I sent it to Josh at like 9 o'clock. I was like, you know what? He's going to wake up to this, and it's just going to start his day off just with fantastic news. But the U.S. interest payments, a trillion dollars annually. Now, I've heard you say previously that we were adding a trillion dollars every 90 days. Um, this, the one, this one says is, is, is $1 trillion we're adding to the deficit every year, just in interest payments alone. No, no, no. So, They're saying our, our payments on the total debt that we have are a trillion dollars a year. So we don't have enough to pay the debt and the bills that we already had. So the deficit grows by a trillion dollars every hundred days. So $3 trillion a year, the interest on that total debt is a trillion is dollars a year. So you're and saying, you're looking yeah. From from pre-pandemic, it was 587. We have nearly doubled the interest costs. So yeah. again, we had politicians for the better part of 20 years. When I say politicians, Republicans. So if you're conservative, you love Fox News, Republicans did it too. If you're a CNN, MSNBC person, you're like, oh, Democrats are the greatest. For 20 years, all of our politicians said, this is cool. We can spend as much money as we want. And we don't really have a problem because the interest expense is under control. Well, this is what happens. The devil has come home to roost. And now you have a trillion dollars of interest expenses double in just the last five years. Yeah. And, and we're reaching the level. So Josh and I, for the better part of what, I mean, it's been over a year, maybe, I mean, for the better part of two years, we were talking how interest rates can't continue to go up because the interest payments on the debt continue to go up as interest rates go up. We were wrong about that because they've kept interest rates high. And guess what? The the de the national deficit now or the interest on the national deficit now exceeds the defense budget, getting pretty close to, uh, to Social Security and Medicare if we're not already there. So, guys, this is a problem. Long term, this is a problem. It's a problem now. It's just being pushed off till later. But at some point, this has to be answered when your guess is as good as mine. But guys enough with the bad stuff you know josh nobody wants to hear that everybody wants they want good news 
So let's give them some good news. Do you, do you have it? Do you have? The I don't news? have any the good news. news is, I, I'm Jeff, just going to make we something actually, up. We ended the day at 459 on the 10 year, which is at least five basis points better than I said, and five basis points further away from that 5.0 that you say we're going to. You know, Josh, you're ruining everything, and I don't like it. So, cool. Josh, we should vote. Do we want Josh to be banned from the show? <laughs> put it in the comments. Let us know. We can give him a button. Like, they could just put out either one of us on a timeout. I didn't like that. I'm out for uh, you. That's, I think that's fantastic. But let's start with um, the starred. But before you do that, if you find any value in the show, do us a favor. Hit the thumbs up. Again, it helps the algorithm push it out to more people just like you, but also helps us accomplish our goal of helping educate home buyers and being able to guide them through the process. So Josh, you know, we, we, we've talked about rates a little bit. You didn't put your rate chart in there this week. I don't know if you were scared because of uh, where <laughs> rates have gone, but you know, we've got Kirk asking about rates, uh, where they are, will they go down by June? So what are your thoughts? Well, I don't disagree with you that we're likely to go higher before then, um, but I definitely still think the trend is down, just slower and longer than than we think. Again, we got a lot of mixed signals in the economy, so it could go either way in the short run. And you talked about us being wrong that the, the federal government can't take rates this high. It's a self-correcting problem in that if rates stay high and interest rate interest expense stays at a trillion dollars a year, money will have to start coming away from other productive purposes. It will slow the economy. It will slow GDP. It will slow inflation. It will bring rates down. I'm not saying it's going to drop rates back to the floor like uh, the, the 14 crises we've had in the last 20 years, um, but it will self-correct. Um, and at some point, it's going to lead to lower interest rates. Your one in 10 chance, people always ask, well, what about stagflation? What if the economy tanks and inflation stays high? It is not a non-zero chance, but it is not the most probable outcome. Most likely you get stagnation in the economy. It brings inflation down and it brings interest rates down. Yeah. I mean, we got janitor on fire saying that Warren Buffett says it's okay as long as the percentage is a small amount, a small amount of the total GDP. But evidently, it's not a small percentage anymore. No, it's not. I mean, I don't know what the, how quickly the deficit has grown over the last since the pandemic, um, but it's it's substantial. I, I forget what the percentage is, but it's it's pretty crazy. In 2023, uh, when interest expense was only 658 billion, that was 2.4 percent of GDP. GDP has increased marginally this year, but we're a third higher on that. So, say you're about three and a half percent of all income goes towards paying interest, interest that we couldn't pay that we continue adding more to. So, yeah, it's important to look at it relative. Like, if you took a very tiny country and you said they have a trillion dollars of interest, you're oh my god, they're bankrupt a giant economy like the US it is not as big of a problem but it is a big and rapidly growing problem that hopefully our friends in Washington start taking seriously sooner rather than later and Jenner on fire basically you said that you it was uh, <laughs> it's cigarettes and Budweiser and fried bologna sandwiches all of those things um are common in the south yes uh, at least where I grew up uh so that could be you know, the reason that they're living longer or shorter rather shorter shorter uh but you know my family eats them too and or they did and they've lived a good good long life most of them uh but anyhow let's i digress let's let's move along uh yeah, we got hold on let's yeah. go back to that last last comment because i actually found a nice piece of data so this is from fred um this does put it in fred, context fred's a great guy that line there at the right side of the screen shows you that massive and rapid spike so we went from 2.7% of GDP in Q1 of 2019 to 3.5 at Q3 of 23. And we're, so we're significantly higher than that now. But putting it in context, back in the 90s, we were at like almost 5% of, of GDP. So is it improving? It had improved, and now it's rapid, rapidly deteriorating. If we end up above 5%, it's going to be a problem. You know, guys, if you're listening to this, and you hear the audio go out. I just want to let you know that uh, Ver not Verizon, Frontier, who bought Verizon Fios. And fiber it. optic, by the way, guys. Fiber optic internet. It's supposed to be the fastest, you know, whatever. We've got 2G. I don't, it's supposed to not have problems like we have. These people are here every day because there's a problem. That's, it's, it's awful. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, 
we are doing our best here to keep it going. But notice there are some some times when it goes out that are out of our control. We don't know what to do at this point other than continue to call them and bitch at them. Uh, hi, guys. It's interesting because I am noticing less single family new construction here in central Indiana and more resale listings. There are still a lot of new construction condos and townhomes. So my guess is, uh, you know, I mean, here's the thing. Mo most of new construction, if it's being built now, has been planned for months potentially even years in advance. I mean, they're not you don't pop new construction up in the matter of weeks, right? So if you're seeing a lack of it now, it's because there was a lag at some point in in, you know, their uh, plan, if you will, to build that new construction. There are markets in Texas, I know, markets in Florida where where construction is still pretty common. So Kind of, you know, it's one of those things that real estate being local, but as far as resale listings, resale are, are typically going to exceed new construction in most markets just because there's more of them available. So from a percentage basis, it's in, it's going to typically be higher when you look at uh, what types of properties are out there. But, you know, you just got to know what's happening in your market and uh, and pay attention to it. Josh, Big G is asking, do you think the lack of being able to buy insurance or the cost of insurance will lower home prices? Or do you think people will just not buy insurance? Well, you don't have an option not to buy insurance. Yeah, uh, if you have a mortgage. Unless, you, unless you're one of the 40% yeah. of people that own your home free and clear, yeah, yeah. it is not an option. Your lender will require you to get it. And if you don't buy it, they will buy it for you, which you agreed to in the terms of your loan in that deed of trust. Uh, and if you don't want to pay for it, cool, they can foreclose on your property. So that's not really an option for most people. We did an entire episode on this, yep. um, what, two weeks ago. And I, do I think it's going to have a significant impact? Not in most areas, but in the areas that are most impacted, absolutely. Part of what we're seeing is that stuff on the Gulf Coast of Florida. Southwest Florida is being impacted more than anywhere else because there were so many damaged properties uh, with Hurricane Ian. The, the premiums have gone up. So you have a lot of damaged properties available and on the market. And then the people that would be stepping in and buying them having really high insurance costs. So can it affect the market? Yes. Will it affect the market across the board everywhere the same? Not at all. Only the places that are most susceptible to natural disasters. Agreed. Uh, you know, and fire areas here in California, right? Some of those areas more expensive, uh, but nothing like you're seeing in in in, in you know Florida. It, it's it's the insurance is crazy there. Um, could it impact that market? Absolutely. Uh, is it going to impact the large majority of the U.S.? I don't think so. At least not now, because most have options uh, when it comes to insurers. California is missing some because of some of the regulation, which we talked about in that podcast. But, um, you know, something to check out if you haven't done so already. In fact, if you haven't been over to the Educated Homebuyer podcast uh, YouTube channel, you should check it out. Like and subscribe if, if you haven't done so already. Uh, and while you're doing that, if you're here on uh, Jeb Smith, that channel, like and subscribe as well, because it, it again helps us continue to uh, to push out good content and um and, and let us know that we actually have your support. So Josh, Rob is asking, doesn't it make sense for anyone to buy new construction? Most of the builders and their lenders offer way better rates. So in some cases, yes, Rob, it does make sense to buy new construction. The problem here in Southern California is that new construction, most of the new construction being built is at super high price points. Uh, you know, in our market, the new construction that's being built in South Huntington Beach starts at like 2 million bucks. So I would love to go down there and buy one of these properties. Two problems with it. One, it's a nice house, um, great floor plans, no yard. Homes are right on top of one another and 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 for two million bucks. And so, you know, you got to weigh the pros and cons of, of why you're buying what you're buying. And a lot of a lot of areas that have a lot of new construction, these uh these properties are being built further away from, say, the epicenter of the city because you know that that land's already been developed. So they continue to go outward uh where they find available land. So you get further and further from where a lot of the activity is. And so you just got to make sense of it and see if it's 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 right for you. But it is true that a lot of builders do have the option to pay down, um, do buy downs on on rates and, and actually come in with a lower interest rate. But at the end of the day, you've got to weigh it and see which option is right for you. Jim, Rob, kind of, you didn't even see the second comment, but you kind of picked up on it. Um, he's under contract, locked at five and a half percent with zero down. So before you guys get excited, it's a VA loan. He's a veteran. Thank you for your service. Um, so yep. VA rates are about three quarters percent lower to start with. Then he's buying new construction 
in Lancaster, and that builder is buying that down to a five and a half percent rate, which is amazing because we may not see those rates in the next five, 10 years. So you're going to benefit from that 30 year fixed rate. That right now. But to to Jeb's point, we're talking, you know, what are we talking? You're you're out in, in Lancaster. Um, even in the further out areas, still going to smaller lot sizes, all of that fun stuff. Um, and I think Jeb, the last time you and I showed the numbers in the charts, uh, fourth quarter of last year. Builders margins uh, during the pandemic had spiked to about 30% of the home's price. We're at about 20% right now. And the biggest reason for that is they're spending on average about thirty dollars to $35,000 of money they're losing. So their lenders are not giving you a better rate. They're not offering you a better rate. They're eating $35,000 of their profits when they close that loan for you. Uh, and Kenneth came in uh, doing a super sticker and giving us three bucks. So appreciate that, Kenneth. Uh, much appreciated. Appreciate the support of the show. Uh, Josh has something, not really a comment, I mean, not really a question, but a comment that I think is interesting. It says, I wish my area new builds would buy down the rate, but apparently people are buying at 1.6 million without any problems. That's essentially what I'm seeing here locally too, right? So, you know, for the better part of my career, the hot price point was like below one, two, right? So, I mean, anything below one, two kind of moved along if it was priced correctly. Now that price range goes upwards, almost 2 million bucks, maybe even higher depending on what market you're in. So it is now, you know, that those buyers that were at 1.2 and whatever, now they're 1.5, 1.6, $1.7 million buyers. So there's a lot of cash out there in the system, um, not just down payment cash, but just cash in general to buy properties outright. I'm seeing it all the time. Um, and I mean, in fact, the property that I just put into escrow was an all cash offer, 15 day close. I mean, it was on the, the house was on the market for two days and, and we got two offers. One was all cash. So, um, and I mentioned this before, but the last house sold a, a couple of weeks ago out of the five offers, four were cash. So there's a lot of money still floating out there in the system. And um, in this case, one of them was actually one of the offers on the property that there was five offers uh, of, of one of the four that were cash. The parents were giving the kids money and it was a $1.6 million purchase. The one uh, that we just put in uh, escrow in Long Beach 1.5 million dollar purchase parents are giving them all cash to so parents if you're not how giving you, your kids how cash, do we get, how do we get adopted up. yeah you need to step up and give your kids some cash help them close on a property all right josh um let's see here what do we got what do we got let's stick with the josh show josh had a follow-up question do you yep. recommend an insurance broker or just going direct to insure which one could possibly give a better deal. I've got some feelings on this, but why don't you jump in first, Jim? You know, I've always traditionally gone to a broker. Uh, brokers typically have access to multiple um, companies. Now, what I'll say is some of those multiple companies, like for the longest time, you might have access to say Mercury and Kemper and some of these other, you know, they have some companies you've never heard of. And the state farms and the all states and those guys didn't compete. You know, they kind of, you had to go directly to them. Um, and so now, the state farms, you know, these guys are gone out of California. And so, but even then, some of the brokers that you talk to don't even have access to some of the guys that they used to have access to for one reason or another. In fact, my latest broker, I called and asked him about an insurance quote. He couldn't get me, I, I ended up with Safeco, right? So he didn't quote me Safeco. And so I got a referral from another buddy. I called another broker who had access to Safeco. And he could give me the quote, whereas my other broker couldn't. He said, they're not, they're telling me they're not issuing new policies and you're getting one. So I don't know what, what's going on here. So I would say talk to a couple of different brokers if you're going to do it. Um, just because there are so much, so many changes at the moment. And it looks that some people are getting different, uh, different responses than others when it comes to some of these companies. Yeah, I think that's the answer is. You used to say, just check with the broker. They'll they'll run it by three, four companies, make sure it's super competitive, someone highly rated. Um, and in the current market, I, I think I shared the story a couple of weeks ago on the show. I have a client whose insurance got canceled. He wasn't even aware of it. So we reached out to our broker and the guy says, I have one. I have one option. I think it was Mercury. They got one option. That's it. So he's a broker, but he doesn't have anyone else to broker it to. He had one and only one option. And he gave us a couple of other direct insurers to reach out to. And that uh, borrower is a veteran and he went USAA and USAA wrote the policy just fine and gave him you know, a very similar premium to what he had with, uh, with his previous insurer. 
Good stuff. Uh, Regino, just with a comment, says, I'm glad I didn't listen to the crash bloggers. Now I have 200000 in equity with a three and an eighth interest rate. Good on you. Congratulations for making the right decision for your life at the time. So good stuff. Um, and even Kenneth, Josh, is, yeah. jo Josh, we're, we're, calm we're down over there. We're battling to put, put, put Kenneth or not on the board. I'm just going to click it off every time you put it on there. There you go. Uh, <laughs> he says, same, locked at 2.75, almost 300,000 in equity. So again, this isn't, I mean, these are people that actually bought and are here still in the show. So for anybody that owns a home and is still in here getting their questions answered or is not even in the market to buy a home, Thank you guys for supporting the show. It means a lot. Um, you know, we do this. We take an hour out of our 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 week, actually more than that, because it takes time to to you know prep some of the stuff and do all of that every week to uh, to come and provide you guys with content and hopefully answer your questions. So if you find any value in this stuff at all, guys, hit the thumbs up, like the channel. Um, it, it does support and it does it does actually mean something. Um, what, so. Jeb, what what should they do when they're actually ready to buy a home or get a loan? They should call you um, and or me. So there's actually a link scroll in the bottom of the screen here. So if you guys want to get connected with myself, you're in Orange County. In fact, I saw one of the, the gentlemen I talked to earlier today. He's he's in Westminster here. His name is Vern. Vern, where's Vern's comment? I saw it. I'm gonna, there he is. I believe this is the same Vern I talked to earlier. So Vern, um, I believe you called me about potentially selling your home. Appreciate that. In fact, one of the listings I have coming on the market tomorrow is from a listener here in Huntington Beach. Beautiful home, guys. Really beautiful home. Comes on the market. It's on too low. It is to die for um, if you're looking for a single family home and it's priced right. I mean, honestly, it is one of the best priced homes in Huntington Beach, completely dialed in. If you're in the market in Huntington and you're not looking at that home, you haven't seen it, you need to see it. It is it is a great piece of property. So, um, yeah. That's 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 what I'll say about that. Uh, beautifully decorated. Uh, Josh, we got, let's see here. Just a quick question on inflation. As inflation stays sticky, do you think home prices will fall to the lows it did in the fall of 2022? So Josh, what are your thoughts on that? And is there a potential podcast coming out on something like this? There could be, there could be. Um, so... I'll, I'll spoiler alert, Jeb RDA let the cat out of the bag. Next Tuesday, uh, we're talking about exactly why home prices are sticking to the upside, why they haven't come down, why we haven't seen a crash, despite people telling people for five years that they shouldn't buy a house because the crash is starting tomorrow. We go through all the data on that next week. But the important thing here, you say as inflation stays sticky, we need to understand why we had that race to the exit in 2022. People listed their homes very rapidly when they felt like rates were spiking and they were missing their opportunity to move. Once we got mid-year, July, August, and rates had already spiked, everyone then just shifted and hunkered down. So there was a bunch of transactions, including buyers jumping in and sellers selling and then buying just to get in under the wire. Now, what we're seeing as we get further away from that, people have given up the hope that they're going to get a 3% interest rate, that things are going to normalize back to that level. And we're seeing people make their decisions based off of what are my needs and what is my ability? So is, has my family grown? Uh, did I get another job offer? Does that job pay enough to buy a home? Cool. I need to sell. I need to buy. So if rates continue going up, Jeb thinks we're going to five on the 10 year that would get us to about 7.8, uh, almost 8% again, that will slow the market. There will definitely be less transactions. It will definitely limit appreciation and it could lead to a small downturn, especially in the markets where we've already seen that. San Francisco Bay Area, Austin, Louisiana, Gulf Coast of Florida. If you're in a market that's soft and rates go higher, it's going to get softer. If you're in a market that's hot, like Southern California, especially entry level price points, if rates go higher, it's going to soften some. It will not remain as hot. But I don't think there's anything that is going to come of inflation. We've seen the worst of inflation. I think our worst case scenario is it staying where we're at. I don't think you're going to see a flare up, but just not a return to 2%. What are your thoughts, Jeb? Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things happening at the moment with potential wars and just things that are out of our control and, um, out of essentially anyone's control here. 
uh, that could lead to to higher cost and um, it could lead to government spending and inflationary things, which in theory could keep inflation higher for longer. Um, I'm hopefully optimistic, wishfully optimistic that that doesn't take place. Uh, but it looks that that's probably going to be something that, that we're going to have to deal with. And so, you know, just, it's taking longer because you have these little cycles. I don't think the market is as strong as the data presents itself, but at the end of the day, we have to go off what the data says. Um, you know, the, we, we say it all the time, the, the, the data, the data doesn't lie. And so for the time being, employment looks strong. Uh, inflation looks to be sticky. Uh, and and you don't have any big months that are being replaced by, in theory, smaller months coming up. So I think the likelihood of inflation staying at these levels is probably what we're going to see for for at least the next couple of months. And then you get down to June or July and there's a zero print. So, you know, like <laughs> that's not going to be good. I, I don't know that we're going to get another zero, but we'll see. But I, I will also say, Jeb, the, the base year effects, everyone knows how to reverse engineer the data. They know what's there. So that's why when we hit this point, you hear we're looking at month over month numbers. We're looking at a three month average, a six month average, just to see where it's going versus waiting for 12 months, especially when you have these highs and lows. It, it's clear as mud at this point. So hard to say, but I don't think it's going to have a huge impact for better or worse in terms of home prices, we just kind of just muddle through the middle here. And I agree with that. Uh, just got my first escrow analysis on my new construction home. I closed last year. Payment is going up $285. So that could be a number of things, right? It could be your property taxes. It could be your insurance. It could be both, right? A combination of both. Chances are new construction. A lot of times the new construction property taxes don't hit right away. Uh, just because of when they bought it, when the county assessor actually does all the, you know, the, the reconfiguring of rates and all of that. So chances are what happened is your property taxes probably went up some um, and it could be insurance too. So a combination of both. And now you're seeing $285, not uncommon, um, you know, it, just depending on the market, 285, I would say is uncommon, but, you know, the, seeing some sort of change in that is not uncommon. Well, Jeb, historically, it's been uncommon. You're like, it's a big jump. But yeah. let's let's think, um, even if you bought new construct or didn't buy new construction, a lot of parts of the country, it takes the assessor's office a while to catch up with the spikes in home prices. So we're seeing those big bumps. So if you were in an area, especially if you bought new construction, so it was under assessed that your lender didn't do a good job of accurately estimating what your tax rate is going to be, and you get that spike of insurance, yeah, 285, historically, you'd be like, that's crazy. Someone screwed up. And now with prices where they are, with property taxes going up and uh, and the insurance, it's not that uncommon. Um, you know, I'm going to click on this real quick because it's it's pretty, it's, it's something that's kind of easy to address. So Eileen says, hey, Jeb, I never see you break down the closing costs. You only give us the cost for PMI and other costs, but never give us an idea of what is closing costs. Please help out. Understand, Eileen, closing costs are very hard to nail down for a number of reasons. One, it varies by state, depending on where you are. Uh, but on, on top of that, just like tip, typical fees vary. But there's also title fees, escrow fees. Your Whatever your purchase price is changes the amount of what those fees are. Some some states are attorney states. Some Sometimes you have, uh, you know, HOA fees that you have. Sometimes you've got to pay you know, uh, prepaid interest. Well, you always have to pay prepaid interest and, and depending on whether you're impounding and doing, there's just so many things that go into it that it's impossible for me to just give you a, a housing price number of 500,000, for example, and say, this is what it's going to be because I don't know where all of those different uh, variables are. That's why I say, I always say, talk to a mortgage professional and let them run the numbers. This time's no different. If you want actual numbers like that, Talk to a mortgage pro because it's very difficult for me to give you accurate numbers that I'm comfortable with. But what I would typically say is that you need somewhere between two to three percent, depending on your state, upwards in New York could be upwards of four percent, two to three percent in addition to your down payment to cover closing costs. And that would include impounds and some other things uh, that you're likely to pay. So just and I'm lumping all costs together. Those are not just fees 
um, from, say, the lender. These are title, escrow, taxes, all of that stuff. Josh, anything you want to add on that one? If it was easy to do for all 50 states and every city in all 50 states, there would just be easy online calculators for it. Instead, the calculators that you see have absurd numbers, you know, $300 a month MI and things of that sort. It's just not that easy when you're talking to a nationwide audience like Jeb's channel does. Um, and another one here just from Chris uh, says, as rates stay higher for longer, does that, how does that affect the golden handcuff effect? I think it only uh, reiterates the golden handcuff thing, right? Is that if you have that super low rate as rates stay higher, it's more sellers going, I'm not selling my house. Like there's no reason for me to do this now unless I have to, because I'm not willing to pay more money for, you know, more money for the house and a higher rate at the same time. But my, you know, we, we kind of saw it last year, right? As rates spiked, inventory just kind of stayed tight. It didn't really move in a significant way just because people were like, mm, and prices stayed stable because there wasn't that flood of inventory. It really is that equilibrium, Jeb. Uh, rates go higher, less people want to sell, less people can afford to buy. So you yep. still have kind of that balance and go in the other direction. We talked about this. If rates drop a percent, you're going to have a lot more buyers, but they should have a lot more homes to choose from because some of those people that want to sell and move up will come back into the market. For a move up or down in prices, a significant move up or down in prices, you have to have a change to that equilibrium. And it's kind of hard to see anything coming along the pike that's going to move it uh, out of equilibrium. Good stuff. Uh, Josh is asking the question, just says, uh, I heard last video about joining your community. Can you elaborate what to expect? I might've missed it somewhere. I have lots of questions. So the community that uh, we we formed, it's on school. It's $5 a month to be a part of it. Uh, there's a link in the description of the video if you want to check it out. But essentially, and it's, it's $5 for the first 50 people that sign up. So I think there's 10 people in there already. So the next 40 will get $5 and then it's going to 20 bucks. So it's going to jump significantly at that point. But essentially, it's just a community where Josh and I can answer questions directly. The community can help each other, one another. But we're also going to do private uh, video like that, like this, but just for that community. We're posting charts in there. Josh and I subscribe. I think we figured out to about $3,000 worth of newsletters a year from different people. And a lot of time, Josh and I are having conversations about things. Sometimes it makes it on the show. Sometimes it doesn't just because some of it's dense and sometimes we just forget. So the idea is that we're going to post this stuff in that community, again, just to help become you know more educated through the process. So that's really all it is, is it's another way to have access to Josh and I, but to also get informed. So if you're interested, check it out. And um, if you guys have any rest, the, the most recent post we have in there, Jeb was asking, what would you guys like to see? Maybe, yeah, maybe what these you two want? guys haven't thought through exactly what you want. Let us know. And we're happy to do it. Unless it's like dancing around on the beach and stuff like that. We're not making, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to dance on a beach. I just don't want to video it. Right. I just, yes. Yeah. You know, in fact, I'd go to the beach right now and dance, Josh, because it was 70 something degrees outside and I'm happy to to be outside when it's 70. Um, Josue says, is a property waiver a good idea? So Josh, explain what a property waiver is. So a property inspection waiver is Fannie Mae's version of an appraisal waiver. Um, there's a couple of kinds um, and the prevalence of these has gone way, way down. We don't hardly see them at all on, on refinances, much more common on purchases with 20% or more down, very high credit scores, people with reserves. The most recent one I saw, I was actually surprised. It was like a 795 FICO, 20% down, but they were going to have 50 grand in their checking account when the deal was closed. And it was also here in Southern California, very vanilla ho homogenous product where the data in Fannie Mae's system them can give them a pretty strong degree of confidence that that value is accurate. So to me, it's a cost savings, anywhere from five to $800, depending on the price point and the location of the home. It's a time savings in that we're not waiting for that report to come back. The only thing you're giving up is whatever certainty you feel from having a neutral third party give you a report telling you, hey, these are the homes that I compared it to. If you've already gone and you've decided I'm buying this home and you don't need that peace of mind, I would save the time and money. But I also would never argue with a client saying, no, I really would like that report. And I guess you have the second piece I would say, what we're seeing more commonly is these property inspection waivers with a property data report. So they send out a person to look at and take pictures of the condition of the property, take measurements, 
but they rely on the algorithm, the AI, the data collected from appraisals for the last 10 years to tell them the values there, but they just want a person to put a set of eyes on it to make sure, hey, this house isn't a horrific condition relative to the other homes, or hey, it's not undersized relative to the other one. So I don't know what triggers the difference, but we're seeing more of the waivers with a property data report than anything else right now. All right, good stuff. Jonathan has a quick question here. Josh says, would a conventional loan with a 25% down payment have a lower monthly payment than an FHA or a USDA loan also with a 25% down payment, 750 credit score? They're going to be pretty similar because in general, the the delta between a, an FHA VA loan and a conventional loan is about anywhere from 0.5 to 0.75% in interest rate on any given day. That FHA is going to have a 0.55% mortgage insurance. And if you put 25% down on the FHA, it's a 0.50 mortgage insurance. So they kind of offset. Um, people are averse to having permanent mortgage insurance like the FHA does. So I don't know that I've ever had anyone look at those two and go, hey, my payment's eight bucks lower on an FHA. Let me do that. And the biggest reason why is the upfront mortgage insurance premium on the FHA. Buy a $500,000 house with that 1.75 upfront mortgage insurance premium, you got another eight something grand that you're adding on to your loan or less equity that you have at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, if you got twenty five percent down, I don't think there's any world which you should be considering with a seven fifty credit score, mind you. You should be considering an FHA loan. If um, you have a six twenty five credit score, that might change that, Jeb. The, no, you no, might see such but, a difference yeah. between that rate that you're like, yeah, give me, give, give me the 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 one and a half lower rate with 0.5 percent mortgage insurance. And when you have a six twenty, six forty, six fifty credit score, those conventional rates can get pretty egregious. Although with twenty five percent down, it's not nearly as bad as the minimum down stuff. Uh, Gonna gonna address another misconception here based on some stuff that came out about a year ago or so. It says are rates lower if you put five percent down instead of twenty? Why? The easy answer is no. No, the rate's gonna be lower if you put twenty percent down than if you put five percent down. Just it's that simple. Uh, but it does depend on credit score. But it's still gonna be a better rate putting twenty percent down than it is five. Uh, there was there was some stuff passed last year that said you know that lower the less uh, money you put down the better credit score, I mean, the best, better rate you were going to get. And again, it's understand the context, right? It's, it's more than a headline. And I think a lot of people just got the headline. There, there is actually some inversion in that LLPA matrix. I remember. Yeah. But it's, but you, you have to look at it. I just went through this with a client yesterday with a 760 credit score. And when we we're looking at it, it was, it was very small, not enough to make a difference when, when you get it. The, the thing that's crazy is that it got cheaper for lower down payments with bad credit scores. But in this situation, the rates are going to be virtually identical between a five and a 20% down at most credit scores. There you go. Um, let's see here, Josh. I don't, let's see. Uh, you know, this is a question we get all the time. It says, I'm a first-time home buyer looking for a house in the four to $500,000 range, but concerned as to whether this is a good time to buy or wait. You know, we're not, the show is not about telling anyone to buy or wait or whatever. It's it's about informing you guys with the information so that you can make the right decision for yourself. That said, um, you know, buying, don't, don't be the person that tries to pick the top or the bottom in the market. Right, I, I think that's where most people fail is that they're trying to get the both both the best of both worlds. They want the lower price home and they want the best interest rates. Typically speaking, those don't both run together um, in the same circle. Right, they 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 work uh, inversely to one another. And so, if I were in the position right now where I'd be thinking about buying a home, I would be, you know, thinking about you know. What time horizon do I have? Is the house going to work for me for the next, say, five to seven years? Do I have some money in the bank? If if something goes wrong, am I able to make the payment? Is it the right time in my life? Am I getting married? Am I having kids? Am I trying to provide a foundation stability for a family? Like Those are the things that I'm thinking about. The answer to all of that stuff is no. Then I, you know, why buy a house? Like Just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, but what we've talked about before, the earlier you buy a home, the earlier in your life or the earlier in your life you can buy a home, the better off you're going to be long term because you're essentially fixing that housing cost to some degree. Now, 
Again, insurance, taxes, that sort of thing are, are going to change and vary over time, but rents are going to continue to increase annually. I mean, I, I just called two different tenants yesterday, uh, properties that I manage. Um, one, well, here in Orange County, we can raise things up to up to 9% right now, year over year, because we can do 5% plus wherever CPI is. CPI in LA County right now is sitting at 4%. That's our local. That's what we use. So you can raise upwards of 9% here in Orange County. Guess what? Both of them got raised 9%. And we're talking, you know, $3,500 rent just went to $3,850 and so on and so forth. So that trend's going to continue for most people. So the earlier that you can fix that cost, the better off you're going to be. Jeb, yep. different sort of a different answer to the same question here. I, I focus in on the part is whether this is a good time to buy or wait. I think we can all say this is not a good time to buy. No, it not is, a great it time. Can be, it can be the right time to buy. Um, we had someone point out uh, in a video in one of the podcast episodes uh, like two months ago, and it was one of the funniest comments ever. They said, my bad. I didn't step in and do the right thing and buy in 2010 when homes were at record high levels of affordability. Problem was I was in third grade at the time. So do not beat yourself up if you were in college or you were starting a new job or getting married when we're going through COVID and prices are still reasonable and rates are really low. That was the right time to buy. So that was the good time to buy. You can't look at a time of record low affordability and go, hey, this is awesome. I'm stoked to jump into this current market, but it can still be the right time for you to do it. And you have to ask yourself if, if hey, this isn't a good time, when's a better time? Do we do I know for a fact that prices are coming down or rates are coming down or I'm getting a big raise in the future? I talked to someone from the podcast, Jeb, just a couple of days ago, and we're going through it. And she goes, Oh, I'm getting a thirty thousand dollar raise in four months. I'm like, Well, today you barely qualify for the low end of what you want. With a thirty thousand dollar raise, you're in a different ball game. So from that, that's uh, you know, it, you have to look at your situation and say is now a good time is not the right question. It's now the right time. And and does it work for me? Yeah. And PBJ, I, I posted this comment on here because it, it kind of goes along with my thoughts to 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 the for the most part it says I am in the opinion, if you can afford to buy right at 7% and are comfortable with the payment buy now when rates fall below 6%, doesn't say this, but I'm going to add this. Not only can you refinance at that time and take advantage of that lower rate, assuming your situation hasn't changed, but the likelihood of prices rising uh, due to demand is pretty high. Um, and you're able to, you know, and, and, and he goes on to say, I'd rather make equity than pay more. Agreed. So I, I don't disagree with that. But like Josh said, it's got to be the right time in your life. Uh, Josh, we've been on 57 minutes, 219 people watching. That's the, the highest number we've had in, uh, in a while. Uh, I don't know Spring if people buying are worried, season, Jeb. people are worried or what, but, um, you know, they're here. Ryan poses the question. Josh says, if prices continue to rise in SoCal, we can just say nationwide prices continue to rise. Who is left to buy them? Josh. Well, if we go back two, three years and you ask this question, people said no one, no one could possibly afford to buy, but they are out there. We showed the chart um, probably three, four weeks ago at the lead off of the show, showing that uh, relative to many major countries around the world, we're one of the more affordable ones. Canada, move to Canada and see how much more expensive and less affordable homes are. Um, the answer is there are people who can buy them. Uh, can and do. I, I don't necessarily know how. I, I talk to a lot of people and less of them qualify today than two years ago, which is not shocking. Affordability is much lower than it was two years ago, but we still close a, a bunch of loans every month and people are still buying them. So the, the question becomes, is there enough to ever cause a spike in prices going forward? Um, it really it goes back to affordability. I don't think there's going to be a change in prices. There will be continued change in incomes, hopefully to the upside, and there will be a continued change in interest rates, hopefully to the downside. And that gives you a lot of wiggle room for the market to move. Um, but we're, we're likely looking at a, a sideways trend for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I, I want to take you guys back to like 2020, 2021. Just started the channel, just started doing lives uh, towards the middle of 20, towards end of 2020, I think I started doing live some, sometime in there. 
And at that time, the idea, people were saying the market's crashing. I'm looking at the market and interest rates going lower and demand going crazier. And Josh and I'm like, if you don't buy a home now, it's going to be 5% more next month. I mean, that's how quickly things were moving. I mean, prices in our market were going bananas. Now you look at the market and I think Josh and I are in agreement that we don't see that sort of appreciation coming for a number of reasons. One, affordability being the primary one, but also just how much homes have appreciated in such a short period of time. You need some of that steam to blow off. You need home prices to move sideways. Um, pull back a little bit. You get closer to that, that long-term trend. Because if you don't and prices continue to escalate at levels like this, it's not good for anybody. I don't think we're there yet where it's it's a problem just because you still have enough demand and inventory is so low. But if you saw huge spikes in inventory right now with rates rising, you got a, you got a recipe for lower home prices. I don't think that we're anywhere near that. But that's what you've got to, you know, that's what you pay attention to. That's why we always, every week we show the new listings data. We're showing you inventory because if the market is going to change, you're going to see it in those numbers before anywhere else. That's where it's going to show up first. And there's a lag in how that's going to affect prices. So again, that's kind of circling us back, taking us full circle to where we started the show. But it's important Um that you know you're always paying attention to your market, not what we're showing here, your market, because we're located in SoCal. So anyway, Josh, we've been on an hour. We've got 236 people watching. You want to do a couple more minutes here, answer a couple of questions. Um, yeah, Exist and Live has a, a good question. It says, is the current situation similar to what happened in the 80s? Home prices rocketing along with interest rates. You did have a period of of pricing, um, not home prices, not really moving up once we got those really high rates in the the early eighties. So you had the late seventies, very early eighties, a lot of inflation. Yes, it took home prices up to stop that inflation. Interest rates went to a very very high level. One of my least favorite numbers that I hear people talk about is home prices as a multiple of of incomes, and they go, oh, home prices are at the highest level ever. Well, who cares if I offered you a 0% interest rate today, but you could pay $250,000 for the house, you'd be like, hell yeah, that payment's way more manageable without having to pay any interest. So we have to take that into account. So if we go back to the early 80s, prices were high, but much lower relative to incomes. Rates went so high that affordability was worse than it is today. But the belief and the expectation was that the Fed was going to be successful. They were going to break the back of inflation and it was going to come down. And at that point, affordability would improve and be better. And it was through the back end of the 80s, through most of the 90s, you had 8, 9, 10, 11% interest rates and home prices still appreciated because affordability was better than it is today. Right now, we have home prices at a, a very high peak uh, and interest rates not not all that high relative to where they've been historically. They're a little bit higher than the historical norms, but you, when you combine the two, it's a very, very hard thing to get. What the hell happened? Oh, did my camera go out? I don't have it plugged in. Just, Hold on. You, you, you decided you didn't want to talk yeah, with us, Jeb? Yeah, I don't want to be part of this thing. I'm out. What is going on here? While, while Jeb's doing that, we have an easy one to answer here. Siete has asked a couple times, thoughts on the California dream for all? The most important thing to know is depending on who you're talking to, they're saying five to 20% of the applicants will get a voucher. So 80 to 95% of the people that want it won't get it. If you are eligible and you were to get a voucher, you would be crazy not to do it. Agreed. So we have we have here, Jeb, um, you know, a, a common misconception. Um, DB says, I'd rather do a 3.5% down FHA loan than have to pay back what they let you borrow and 20% of my appreciation on top of paying the fees to sell. First of all, the fees are irrelevant. You go to sell your house, you're going you're to pay paying those fees. either so way. Nothing to do with anything. So when we go back to it, I'd rather pay FHA with 0.55% mortgage insurance forever with a 15% higher mortgage. So I'm going to qualify for less home. I'm going to pay more so that I don't have to give up 20% of the appreciation on a more expensive home that I would not have been able to buy otherwise. That's insanity. I did a video on this on my channel because I've seen like 27 versions of this question. And you're like, Apparently, you don't know how to pull out a spreadsheet or grab a calculator because unless you own that home for 10 years and homes 
tripled in the next 10 years and you had to pay back some egregious amount of appreciation, there's no world in which that is not the cheapest way to own a home. So the question, you just don't like us. Jeff. Dude, I, I don't know what's going on. The uh, My camera has a battery. It's, it must be getting too hot or something. I got you. But anyway. So the, the, the question just comes back to um, if you can get the money, it is the absolutely the number one best way to go. And I'm not a big fan of Cal HFA loans. This is the best program they've ever made for those who can get the money. Well, anyway, Josh, I'm going to let you close this out. So uh, I'm going to take myself off the camera. You do. Well, no, I'm going to put myself on the camera. You're, Actually, you're just going to put your, your bouncing little white. Yeah, I just I, I guess there. So. Let's, let's, here. I'm I'm on the camera now. <laughs> Nobody's there. Um, anyway. You uh, go back on there and put yourself in. I can't do it from my side. I'm having issues over here. Let's see. There, there I am. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Jeb's little bubble out of there. But does that take you? <laughs> I just think close I need it out. Bubble. I need your bubble in there for you to be able to talk. So in case you wanted to to add your final words of wisdom. But anyways, 200 here. It's the most we've had um, in the, the last several weeks. Appreciate you showing up, listening to the information, asking really good questions. We will be back next week to, again, answer your questions. If you're interested in the school community, go and check it out. Jeb has a link in the description, whether you're watching on the podcast channel, whether you're watching on Jeb's channel. We appreciate you guys being here and look forward to seeing you again next week. Adios, amigos.